Last time I talked about the direct image complexes in the affine case. Now, I would like to generalize the direct image complexes for morphism between projective varieties. So that's the goal. And I haven't achieved that goal. But I would like to tell you why I want this goal and how far I'm got. And then um, I explain what I mean with how far we have gotten. All right, so F is the morphism between projective variety, F a Korean chief, and X, uh, I would like to compute R, F lower staff, F as an object in the derived category of Y. This is sort of a fundamental tool. And um, why? Well, here's an example, because we want to make Fourier Mukai transform explicit. So, you know, nowadays there is a lot of derived algebraic geometry, and the Fourier Mukai transforms are one of the fundamental tools. But um, at least for me, this looks like a scary formula. Um, it will. I mean, if you work in the abstract, so if you say x is an abelian variety and y is a dual abelian variety, and you don't specify anything further, and P is a Poincare bundle, well, it's actually not, I mean, Mukai proved that these derived categories are um, equivalent to each other by using the Fourier Mukai transform. So maybe I should explain why this is called Fourier Mukai transform. So RP2 lower star is sort of integration along the fiber. So we take a function on x space, so think of chiefs as functions, which is completely wrong, but think of chiefs as functions. So if we take a chief of functions on one space, we multiply with the Fourier Mukai kernel and do integration along the uh, fiber. Then we get a new. So that's why it's called Fourier Mukai transform. Anyhow, you're pretty safe in asking an um, explicit question unless you have sort of specific x and y's. So the goal would be once I have x, say a K3 surface or a pair of K3 surfaces, and a um, Poincaré bundle, then we should actually be able to take a sheaf here and compute its image or more generalized for an object in the derived category. So that would make, uh, and I would like to bring it to the computer. So that's one of the goals, uh, which will be a long-term goal, I presume. The hope, of course, is that if you transform one in, in, from one setting to the other setting, that in the second setting, certain things will be easier to compute than in the original setting, or vice versa. Anyhow, so that's the goal. How far did we got? Well, we can do this as y is projective space. And I would like to explain why we can do this if y is projective space. So, and um, so that we use take resolution on product of projective spaces. So x and y are projective varieties. The graph is then a sub-variety of Pn cross Pm. And the sheaf on x can be thought of as a sheaf on Gf, so a sheaf on Pn cross Pm. Now, consider a neutral normalization of y, a linear neutral normalization. Then we can compute by computing Tate resolution of products uh, this object in dB of PD. Now, pi lower star is really just a forgetful functor, right? It's sort of the same objects, but we forget the action of the additional variables. So since we can compute this, which is simply that, and since this is a forgetful functor, all which remains to be done is if we have this object, um, pi lower star of this object, we have to recover the action of the yi. And I believe this should not be too difficult to sound like a harmless step to do, but I haven't done it and I'm very happy if you help me with that. Okay, so I have to review the Bidenson monad on Pn, so the u functor. So 
U denotes a universal rank N subbundle on Pn, so we have a short ex uh, sorry. Um, we have short exact sequence like that. And then we consider the additive functor, which takes uh, one of these omega e to the a to, um, to uh, map this object to lambda a of u. And if we have an element in the exterior algebra, we have a multiplication map from omega a to omega a b in case e is in uh, lambda a minus b of v. And the same element x, so lambda a of u, of course, sits in lambda a of w, tends to o. So here it x by contraction induces and map on your attraction here. So we can apply this functor now to the Tate resolution and obtain a bounded complex u of f. It's bounded because they have only finitely many exterior powers. So it makes out of the Tate resolution a bounded complex. And um, the, uh, the theorem with Gunnar is uh, that uf is a monad for the sheaf f in the sense that the cohomology of this complex uh, is only is concentrated in degree 0 and has, um, is f there. So that's, um, yes, so that's the basic thing uh, we know. Now I would like to go to a product of projective spaces. So P it will now be a product of Pn1 times times Pnt, so T factors. Um, uh, W1 up to Wt will be underlying spaces and then I take a uh, the symmetric algebra and um, on W I take the dual space with dual basis and E the exterior algebra there. I have a dualizing module omega E which is just lambda of W as before so nothing new here. Um, the degree of course the, um, we have a finite grading these elements should be in principle of degree one, but actually maybe there is ZT graded to one of the components one and all the other ones are zero and the uh, corresponding dual basis of course is a negative degree. Now if you have a multiple degree I will denote by absolute value the sum of the total degree. So what should be the shape of a Tate resolution? So let's think about the case of Pn1 times Pn2, two factors. If we can do two factors, we can do the general case, I believe. So, so it's pretty clear what it should be if we have a box tensor product. If you have the chief of the first projective space F1 and we pull it up and um, the second uh, sheaf of the second factor and we take the exterior as a tensor product of these two then the Tate resolution should be clearly the tensor product of the Tate resolutions. Now now this is a double complex, an infinite double complex two infinite double com um, um, yeah, so you have two, two double complexes um, yeah infinite complex. If we take the tensor product, there's no longer going to be finitely many terms. So the terms in the Tate resolution which we look at will, um, will be uh, no longer finite, but they should be of this shape. So n, of course, is this is multi-index n1 up to nt. i is correspondingly a multi-degree, um, um, multi and then the formula should be uh, like that. So we would like to have such a, a complex with this term, uh, uh, this infinite sum. Well, uh, oh yes, um, it's oh yeah, integer? Or no, and, uh, so I should, n1 up to nt is a multi-index, right? And i is correspondingly a multi-index. So. So that makes sense. This is still a multi-index, but 
Of course, in cohomology, we don't have multi inlets, so you, you need the absolute value. Right? It mixes the term a little bit. All right. A is a multi index in ZT, and the absolute value of A should be D. F is the um, Korean chief on the produ product. Arbitrary current chief on the product. Okay, so that should be the formula. It's a bit of little bit scary because the terms are no longer finely degenerated, but otherwise it looks pretty much the same as before. So, okay. So le let's do an example. I consider the map of omega e to omega e minus two zero four copies of minus one minus one o zero minus one and the map given by all the monomials if you be two in the x here algebra so v and p1 cross p1 so v is v1 plus v2 i use for the first uh, set of um, e0 e1 for the second i use f0 f1 as variables so this term here maps this here to this minus two. These four terms here map in here and the last one maps there. So all together we have six. And well, I can take the image, L of the image. I can apply the functor L, which still makes sense. And it's a minimal free resolution of a module M of global sections of a rank three vector bundle with cohomology as indicated on the next slide. I see, so, um, so, so I've, I have A and B, and I take, in the, look at the table in the range from minus three plus plus three. Now, I can have H0, H1, and H2 because I'm on the surface, so, and I want to write this down in the matrix. And what I do, I write down this H polynomial, which is sort of, uh, here I take the dimension in HI, and I multiply with a new variable HI so that I get a neat little picture, right? So, so this is the cohomology, and the, the injective resolution of P, the kernel, um, of the kernel of M, well, um, is given by the so 1 by 6 was the term which we had. So here is the 1 and here uh, the 6. And uh, then the next is 20, which is this diagonal. And then they have a 40, there's a, uh, and there's a color misprint, 12, 15 plus 12, which is only 39. But I I mean, it's easy to guess that there should be a 3 here and a 3 there, so then I get to 45 and so on. So this is sort of uh, the injective resolution of that object. So I have a finitely generated ZT graded module whose um, sheafification is a given sheaf on P. So then I claim that there are exists the multi indices that so if I take larger multi indices uh, I have nice vanishing in generation results so the first uh, thing I have if I take this module truncate it and see and shift it so that it um, gets um, uh, the generators at degree zero then it has a linear resolution in the following sense these three modules fk F0, F1, and so on. The FK is sort of, of course, the direct sum of all possible twists. Betty numbers beta KA. K is a homological index. A is a degree index. And there should only be non-zero case where K is the absolute value of A. So that's sort of linear in the multigraded sense. Um, the modules themselves, MC, is H0 of... Uh, Um, 
is MC is the A0 FC and the higher cohomology vanishes. And the next thing is if I take um, a subset J indexed by J of my product of projective spaces, I have a partial projection and I want that the partial projection, my sheaf behaves well with respect to the partial projection. So, sorry, um, if I push this sheaf down, then the push down sheaf should also have a linear resolution. And um, the higher direct images of the push down uh, thing uh, should be simply zero. So for all c greater equal to b, and we call such a b sufficiently positive for m. And it's uh, not hard to show that such sufficiently positive uh, numbers exist. So last time I had these functors R and L in the BGG. Uh, so re reciprocity still works. So if R and L respect the finer grading, that's the point. R of m greater or equal to c gives the part of the Tate resolution in the positive grad mode, right? So um, R of m11, of course, is just sort of um, a vector space tensor omega uh, e twisted by 1, 1, if you want. So we get sort of a double complex out of the case in case uh, t is equal to 2 and 1, 1 is sufficiently positive. That's sort of what the R thing looks like. Then now we might ask what is the kernel of that? I mean, that is sort of what was the original high truncation. And then the Tate resolution, which we got in the um, single factor case, was that we would resolve. So if you resolve this, then, well, in case minus 2 minus 2 is still positive, then the beginning terms is actually clear. So the beginning terms are just sort of um, up to a shift. So here, right? So here there will be a degree 2 map in a certain sense, yeah, a degree 2 map. Um, and that will be the resolution. And what is the map? The map is the following. I have a map from here to here. And then to there. And it's this map here is the um, composition. By the way, I could have also gone this way and that. Because it's a complex, this is the same up to sign. So the theorem is if C is sufficiently positive, then if I truncate here with C, then the beginning of a resolution looks like that. And it's an exact complex. All right. Here's a little corollary, um, which we get out of reciprocity. We had this kernel P. So L of P, LP of C is going to resolve n greater equal to C. But it's sort of also this PC, which sort of had this injective resolution in that direction, is also the image of that object. So the length um, the, um, this projective resolution has length uh, dimension of S minus T. So you know if you take a, a saturated uh, module on projective scales, the resolution is at most number of variables minus one. It could be N plus one because we have N plus one variables. Here it's only number of variables um, minus one. Now we have t factors is number of variables minus t. So it's sh shorter. So we were surprised to see that. It's sort of basically one non-zero divisor for each factor, which is, um, well, anyhow. T was the that's the number of projective spaces, right? T is the number of factors. So this is well known if we have uh, one factor, right? But um, so for high truncation, uh, we uh, have um, a shorter resolution than uh, maybe you might expect naively. 
So now, what should we do with it about the tape resolution? Well, this is fine. And this is sort of, I mean, this sits in the first quadrant and this sits in the third quadrant, right? And uh, we're missing the second and the fourth quadrant in this picture. So what we could do is the following. We could remove this part here and resolve that instead. And what we would get is this piece here. So I go, I, instead of taking this, I go to that. So making this smaller piece, uh, the, the, uh, this quadrant smaller, uh, bigger. So the lower quadrant is going to grow. And that's what we're going to do. So given M and B sufficiently positive for M, then we have this resolution TC of this kernel PC for all say, and we have a directed system. We have mapped from uh, TC prime to TC if C prime is greater or equal to C, and then we take the inverse limit. And the take resolution of M is defined to be generated by the homogeneous elements inside this inverse limit. So that um, at first looks like, um, yeah, that's the way it is. So the first main theorem, the Tate resolution, T of F, constructed this way, is exact. And for each multi-degree A, the space of homogeneous elements TF of A of multi-degree A in this total complex is finite dimensional. So multi-degrees occur only in a, b a bounded range. And then, of course, the first goal is, uh, uh, is then to have these formulas for the cohomology, which is just the analog of the corresponding formula as before. So, so this is joint work with Eisenbach, Daniel Ehrman, and myself. Okay, now, how to prove this? The main point is you have to prove the second main result first. So let's talk about the derived category of the product of projective spaces. So we have the tautological NK subbundle of PNK. And then for multi index A, I said U to the A to be the corresponding um, exterior tensor power. Of course, UA is non zero only if the multi index lies between zero and uh, N. And then we have this well-known theorem of Bilinson and uh, uh, people who sort of extended this to products. I'm not quite sure whom to contribute this. This UAN form a full, strong, exceptional series for the derived category of um, the product of projective space, which is right orthogonal to the strong, exceptional series of line bundles um, in a bounded range. So we have uh, the derived category is sort of basically free on a rectangular uh, area of uh, um, objects. Um, yeah? So the, 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 the tape resolutions we have, are, are they double complexes? No, no, they're, no, they're not double complexes. Uh, they're, no, they're not double complexes. Well, they are. I took this resolution. Of course, this resolution uh, in the beginning had a double complex structure, but in the, um, in, as you will see um, uh, shortly, uh, in general, there will not be double complexes. There can't be because uh, the cohomology groups are mixed up too much for that. So there are, I think some people call them multi complexes because, yeah. I will explain how the maps go in an example. So now the U functor we define exactly as before. And then we have uh, the, uh, the same theorem as before, that if you apply the U functor to the take resolution, we get a monad for the sheaf F in the sense that it's sort of as before. So the U functor will pick only, of course, finitely many terms of the take resolution and so on. All right. So this is nothing new. I 
I'm going to try to characterize these complexes again. So complex T of graded free E modules with terms, well, for each multi-degree I might have a vector space, and then I have omega E minus A, is locally finite if locally finite in the degree sense, if A, for each A in ZT, the, uh, the sum of these vector spaces is finite dimensional. So the degrees as do not spread out entirely. Now, um, I'm going to define strands, quadrants, and regions. So I have a subset I, J, K of my index at 1 to T, and I can sort of um, have a multi-index C, and I can res um, take, um, build a new complex T, C, I, J of K, where I just, t uh, well, the first index I, I restrict the A to be less than C, I for, the, for J, the middle one, I have equality, and for uh, um, uh, the one in K, I have greater equal to, right? So it's a proper region complex if um, the union is not everything. If I uh, have only a J and the other set as the empty set, I call it a strand. And um, well, if I have I in K and in the middle, empty set in I union K um, is 1 to T, I call it a quadrant. Right? These are the terms which live in the... Yeah. So, now comes the corner complex. So I have these quadrants. The last quadrant is T greater or equal to C, T, C, 0, 1, and 10, uh, T smaller than C with the first quadrant, and they have inter intermediate quadrants. So this is the last quadrant, and then they have sort of lots of other quadrants, and they have mapped between them. OK, I'm going to show this map uh, in one of the next slides. So I have these quadrant complexes. And here is the second main result, which we have, which is an astonishing exactness properties of these locally finite free E complexes. So w the following conditions are equivalent. Every strand of T is exact. Every proper region complex is exact. Every corner complex is exact. Um, every corner complex is exact for sufficiently large C. And every proper region complex is exact for every sufficiently large C. Now, my construction of the um, cake resolution shows that a condition 5 is satisfied for cake resolution of sheaves, right? So, so let's look at our example. So this was this example on P1 cross P2, which I had before. And um, I write down the total uh, Betty numbers um, of this complex. Let's see. All right, so we start out with this quadrant, which is sort of this piece here. And it has the corresponding lower quadrant, which is this piece here. And then the corner complex. Now, corner complex, well, these maps which sort of do not lower the h degree, they are linear. This is a linear map, but this here, which sort of um, uh, lowers the h degree, is a quadratic map. So had, we had this quadratic map going in this direction, right? In all three directions. So here you actually see example. The first example was one where the Tate resolution uh, wasn't a double complex because we had also diagonal maps. So we had this here, this was this E1, E2, and then here's the EIFI, and this was this one. And we can easily compute actually what the kernel is. It's of course E1, E2 times F1, or E1, E2 times F2, which will annihilate everything, or the other way around. So there are sort of four elements in the kernel, and then there are 15 
down here, which are these terms over here. And the corner complex is a complex I map from here to that region. For example, there's a map from here to here, which is of degree 2. And then I go with this map from degree 2 to here, which is then of degree 3. So that will be one of the maps. Uh, this map, I believe, we have a map from here to here of degree 2, but we also have a map from here to here of degree. This here doesn't reach anything because we have a zero here. So this term is superfluous, but this this will give a contribution of this 4 to 1. Okay, so, so, so for example, 45 is because if we continued this 1, 2, I'd have a 3 in the next position. So That's the, right. So the top row I see, but I don't, so can you explain again that 4 to the 1, the, the, to the 8, that, that 1 is the h. This is 4, yeah, okay. right, 2 plus 2, and then this plus this plus this is 8 plus 7, which is 15. Okay. And then here, there must be, I'm missing something, right? The next number is slightly different. So in this case, we have, um, we have sort of a piece which is sort of the first quadrant, and then we have a piece which is of the last quadrant. In general, they might overlap. That's because uh, the degree distributes them. Uh, so all right. Um, so now the dark image complexes, you can guess what it will be. So I have a Korean chief, TF its state resolution, J is subset of the indices, and I have the projection, I have the complementary indices. And um, I can take the strand where I sort of fix the degrees of the complementary indices, so I don't change those. This has the effect that this strand has only variables in the exterior algebra corresponding to J. So this complex really is just this complex tensorized with a, a free module over um, in the other variables. So that's the flex extension of the minimal complex Tj of free EJ J modules. And if I apply the U functor of that, I'm going to get the direct image complex of F shifted by C in dBj. So let's see how this looks in practice. I have my example again. Here is one of the strands, right? And so P is the projection to that factor. And well, so R pi lower star has this cohomology table, this uh, Tate resolution. So there's one quadratic map from here to here, and otherwise there's nothing. So H1 of the image sheaf in degree uh, 0 should be one-dimensional. So this says that R pi lower star is, um, so the p lower star is concentrated in degree 0. It's pi lower star of f. And this is going to OP1 of minus 2, because that um, looks like the Tate resolution of OP2. And then if I shift back a little bit, here. So if I go to that strand, then I see that the direct image complex of this sheaf, so I've now down a little bit, um, is totally concentrated in homological degree 1, and it's going to be O2, O2 to P1. So why it's concentrated in homology degree 1? Well, there will be only H along this line if you um, com complete this diagram. So we can read off. Um, the cohomology. Now to compute this, to compute um, u of this state resolution, we only have to compute a finite range. So it's a finite computation which allows you to compute the right image complexes. So open problems. So we had these many exact subquotient complexes of TF. For example, what is the meaning of a half-plane complex? I mean, that should mean something. I have no idea what it really means. Um, double complexes, coming back to Gunnar's question. Suppose I have a direct sum of um, box products. Then the Tate resolution is going to be a double complex, a direct sum of double complexes. Is the converse too? We don't know that.
Last time, I said that, well, we have an affine space spec A. We saw that every bounded complex can be seen as a direct image complex right? um, of a vector bundle on spec A cross Pn. Could it be <coughs> that any object in DP Pn is a direct image of a single sheaf on a product of projector spaces under a projection to its one of these factors that sort of would undi um, underive the derived category in a certain sense. We don't know that. So objects F in DBP can be represented by a bounded minimal complex of the form F J U uh, I A I J, right? I mean, by so there is exists the smallest complex T of three E modules that U, U of T is going to be that complex F. But how to compute a Tate resolution F? of f that is an exact complex of f prime of free e modules so that whenever we shift and twist this complex we're going to get that f of c for every c in, um, in t. We can do this for a single factor. We have nice code in uh, Macaulay how to extend uh, from uh, um, an arbitrary complex to a take resolution but we can't do this in general. So. Thank you very much.